So my name is Tom Wilms. I'm a uh, registered professional biologist. I'm an instructor at the Nicola Valley Institute of Technology. And uh, I'm also a PhD student with the University of Northern British Columbia. Today, I'm going to be pre presenting on sort of some of the uh, habitat characteristics of the Nicola watershed, as well as uh, some of the general geography. So we'll start off by describing the cultural setting of the Nicola Valley. So the Nicola watershed lies within the unceded traditional territories of the Entlakatmuk and Shilk nations. Uh, this includes uh, six local First Nations, uh, including the Upper Nicola, Lower Nicola, Coldwater, New Iach, Shacken, and Cook's Ferry. It's important to note that the RAMS uh, workshop that we're working on here for the Nicola watershed uh, is, is being run to support ongoing uh, habitat restoration initiatives and research as identified through the Nicola Forum. So I'll start by describing some of the ecological characteristics uh, within the setting of the Nicola, Nicola watershed. So the Nicola watershed is located within the semi-arid steppe highland ecodivision. Uh, this ecodivision is characterized by generally hot, uh, dry summers, uh, cold winters, and low precipitation generally within the range of 300 to 500 millimeters per year, um, with higher elevations receiving more precipitation than lower elevations. Vegetation communities typically transition from semi-arid bunch grasses. These are typically blue bunch wheatgrass, uh, needle and thread, and some Idaho fescue on cooler north slopes, to um, up into uh, ponderosa pine ecosystems, Douglas fir, and lodgepole pine and in interior spruce at middle elevations in montane ecosystems. Within this ecological setting, uh, it also includes a scattered component of subalpine ecosystems, which are characterized primarily by uh, Engelmann spruce and subalpine fir, although you do have a component of uh, mountain hemlock as well uh, in, in western portions of the watershed. Central and eastern portions of the watershed are generally drier due to the climatic effects of lower elevation and uh, as well due to being in the rain shadow effect of the Coast and Cascades Mountains. This is a figure of the Nicola watershed, which includes several important subcatchments, which we'll describe uh, later on. The Nicola River watershed um, as a whole is about 7,200 square kilometers. It's uh, a sixth order stream at its confluence with the Thompson River uh, at a 150,000 scale. The stream center line length of the Nicola River is about 188 kilometers, and it includes two primary geomorphic zones. It has a low gradient segment, generally between Nicola Lake and uh, around the city of Merritt, where the Nicola River flows through kind of naturally erodible uh, silts that were deposited in a, a glacial lake, so glacial lacustrine silts. Downstream of this segment, the stream gets a bit steeper in gradient, and develops more of a uh, riffle pool morphology uh, between the Coldwater River confluence with the Nicola River and Spences Bridge. Uh, the stream is generally unconfined uh, upstream of New Iach, but becomes more confined downstream of New Iach uh, in the canyon. So here's an aerial image of those tortuous meanders that I described earlier, uh, upstream of the city of Merritt, between Merritt and Nicola Lake. And here's a aerial image of uh, morphology typical of the steeper gradient downstream of Merritt towards uh, Spences Bridge. Between the Coldwater River and Spice Confluence, there's extensive groundwater input on the Nicola River and a high degree of channel complexity, including uh, really important off-channel habitats, uh, side channels, and uh, really important rearing habitat. So uh, this segment between the Coldwater River uh, confluence with the Nicola and the, the confluence of Spies Creek with the Nicola represents sort of the, the most important spawning reach for a late run Chinook in the Nicola River. Uh, myself and uh, Garrett Whitworth also found with our thermal imaging in uh, 2016 that uh, this area also has extensive uh, groundwater upwelling as we uh, found lots of evidence of groundwater upwelling in those thermal images that we collected. The segment of stream downstream of Spies Creek 
uh, generally becomes more confined, as I described earlier, mm -hmm. and the topography exhibits more abundant deep pool habitat, especially where uh, the stream is confined by the valley wall. And in the absence of cottonwoods in this uh, segment of the stream, uh, shade is generally provided by the, the valley wall, with the Nicola River generally running east to west. So which is shaded on its south bank. Uh, here's an example of some of the of uh, one of the thermal images that we collected as part of the uh, the groundwater uh, research that we did uh, in that 23 kilometer segment between the Coldwater River and Spies Creek. And so here you can see uh, cool groundwater upwelling from a, a spring that's uh, located uh, adjacent to the main stem of the Nicola River, and you can see that uh, the evidence of the the mixing of that cool water uh, into the warm main stem of the Nicola. Flows in the Nicola are partly regulated by the dam on Nicola Lake and there's been important work uh, that's been completed recently uh, through the development of the Nicola Water Management Tool by ESSA Technologies and this tool has allowed um, decision-making uh, processes to be supported uh, in terms of allowing for the uh, requisite flows for various uh, aquatic uh, species uh, in the reaches downstream of the dam. So uh, important subcatchments to the Nicola River include the Coldwater River, as seen in this figure, Spias Creek, these two watersheds draining uh, the east slopes of the Cascades Mountains, uh, Gishon Creek watershed to the north, which is the second largest uh, watershed in the uh, subcatchment sub in the watershed. Uh, we've got Clapperton C Creek, which is uh, a little bit smaller, but uh, has uh, the potential to uh, provide important thermal refugia, particularly for uh, rearing salmonids in the system. Uh, and moving east, we also have uh, Quilshanna Creek and uh, the Upper Nicola watershed. So the Upper Nicola watershed uh, represents an area of about 2,300 square kilometers, about 32% of the entire Nicola watershed. Uh, elevations are uh, not as high as you see in eastern or in western portions of the watershed, generally between 600 and 1,600 meters in elevation. Uh, this includes three main subcatchments: uh, Spockman Creek, Quilshanna Creek, and Clapperton Creek. Uh, the streams of the Upper Nicola watershed are generally lower in gradient and less confined by topography than those of western subbasins in the watershed. Uh, storage is also um, far more abundant in, this, in the eastern portions of the watershed uh, due to the number of uh, large lakes, some of which have uh, control structures on them, as well as a lot of the extensive wetlands that are found at, um, at all elevations across this watershed. Uh, conservation concerns in terms of aquatic species shift more towards anadromous or non-anadromous fish species when compared to western portions of the watershed. So this can include species like kokanee. There's also a lot of concern over the introduction, the recent introduction of uh, invasive yellow perch to the system, which have dispersed rapidly from Douglas Lake and now into Nicola Lake. Clapperton Creek is a smaller watershed, only, only 232 square kilometers, representing only about 3% of the Nicola watershed. It's a fourth order stream that's about 30 kilometers long. Elevations range from 600 meters with its, uh, at its confluence with the Nicola River downstream of Nicola Lake Dam to about 1700 meters on the Nicola and Gishon plateaus. Uh, headwaters of the plateau have been extensively uh, salvage logged following um, the mountain pine beetle outbreak. And uh, reports of equivalent clear-cut areas for this region show that um, ECA tripled between 2003 to 2013 to about 44 uh, percent. Luke Workington in his thesis work also found a high uh, equivalent clear-cut areas uh, where uh, representing about 36 uh, percent clear cutting over the last 20 years, so similar numbers there. Clapperton Creek is fairly steep and is generally confined by bedrock in its lower reaches uh, upstream of the alluvial fan. Storage is limited to some small reservoirs within the watershed. 
And this stream is strongly influenced by groundwater and has maintained more suitable temperatures for salmonids through the summer when compared to some of the other tributaries and main stem streams in the watershed. This stream may also provide important thermal refugia for uh, Chinook, Coho, and Steelhead. Gishon Creek is uh, the second largest watershed in the Nicola, uh, representing an area of about 1,230 square kilometers. It's a fifth order stream that's about 80 kilometers long. Uh, elevations range from 575 meters at its confluence with the Nicola to about 1,700 meters where it shares a headwater with uh, Clapperton Creek. Uh, the headwaters as well here have been extensively salvaged logged following the mountain pine beetle outbreak and uh, e equivalent clear cut areas have been reported up to 32 uh, percent between 2003 and 2013. So here I've included some uh, aerial imagery uh, through time starting in 1984 of the uh, Nicola and Gishon Plateau. So this is up near Surrey Sussex Lake. Uh, this is prior to the uh, construction of the Coquihalla Highway. So in 1984, there was a little bit of clear cutting up there, but not too much. 10 years following that, you've got the uh, Coquihalla Highway showing up, uh, a bit more logging. Another 10 years, uh, logging continues to increase. And then in the mid 2000s with mountain pine beetle outbreak, uh, you see extensive salvage logging uh, through to 2000, this imagery that was cl collected in 2014. Uh, so this kind of gives you an idea of the level of disturbance that we're seeing in our upland forests, of uh, uh, particularly in the Gishon watershed and Clapperton Creek. Mammoth Lake and the extensive wetlands of the plateau provide important storage of water um, for uh, later in the summer. Uh, Gishon Creek generally flows through unconfined glacio-fluvial deposits, as uh, can be seen by the extensive eskers, uh, particularly downstream of Mammoth Lake. This reach also provides important spawning and rearing habitat for Chinook, Coho, and Steelhead. Uh, the Coldwater River watershed uh, represents an area of about 960 square kilometres, or 13% of the Nicola watershed. It's a fifth order stream that's about 90 kilometers long. Elevations range from 594 meters above sea level at its confluence with the Nicola just downstream of the city of Merritt to uh, higher elevations around the 2000 meter mark. Uh, this watershed has experienced less clear cutting in the past uh, couple of decades compared to some of the other watersheds within the Nicola at only about 13%. The Coldwater River watershed lacks some of the important storage areas as seen in other parts of the Nicola watershed, so it doesn't have a lot of uh, large lakes or extensive wetlands. However, oral accounts of the upper watershed uh, sort of tell a different story of more extensive wetlands prior to the construction of the Coquihalla Highway to Hope. Uh, lower summer base flows in recent years have also led to water use restrictions to protect critical flows for aquatic life which has resulted in a lot of uh, sort of negative social interactions within the watershed with respect to various user groups that rely on uh, this uh, important source of water. Upper reaches of the Coldwater River provide uh, critically important spawning habitat for interior Fraser Coho, uh, but also for some unique uh, early run Chinook as well as steelhead. Uh, main stem and off-channel habitats downstream of spawning areas have been shown to uh, provide important rearing habitat for all of these species that have a freshwater residency period as juveniles. So this includes Chinook, Coho, and Steelhead in this system. Luke Turcott, in his uh, recent master's work, found that uh, fine scale site fidelity existed in uh, over half of the coho spawners that were uh, spawning in this system, the remainder of which strayed to new spawning sites. This plasticity and homing behavior uh, may provide a critical role in population resilience in light of uh, some of the major disturbance events that we've had in recent years. Groundwater is critically important to maintaining flows on the Coldwater River, and uh, Golder has recently completed part one of a two-part report looking at groundwater surface water interactions uh, on the Coldwater River. The 
as part of this project, they identified both gaining and loosing reaches within the Coldwater River. And they also recorded on uh, proportions of water withdrawals uh, with respect to the various user groups that rely on this water. They found that 70% of groundwater was withdrawn from shallow, unconfined aquifers that share a water table uh, with the river. This report may be key in prioritizing suitable reaches for restoration works, that is uh, gaining reaches um, that are serviced by groundwater, uh, but it may also provide some important information in terms of uh, water conservation efforts uh, moving forward and identifying those uh, sections of river that are losing surface water into the aquifer. Bias Creek watershed is about 800 square kilometers and represents 11% of the Nicola watershed. It's a fifth order stream that's about 50 kilometers long. Elevations range from 524 meters above sea level at its confluence with the Nicola uh, up to about 2200 meters. So it's, uh, it's the, a, a higher elevation of watershed uh, compared to some of the eastern portions of the watershed. 6% of the watershed has been clear cut since 2000, so not nearly as much as we've seen in some other portions of the watershed. Spice Creek and its uh, tributaries tend to be steep and generally confined by topography. Uh, In-stream flows in Spice Creek do become a concern during years of early snowpack depletion, as there's also not a lot of natural forms of storage within uh, Spice Creek or Macca Creek watersheds. Spice Creek provides critical habitat for some early run Chinook, as well as for Steelhead and Interior Fraser Coho. So if we look at the hydrology of the Nicola watershed, the Nicola River generally exhibits a hydrograph that's typical of snow dominated uh, regimes. Peak flows in the Nicola are typically experienced in late April through May, and fall flooding generally is uncharacteristic of the watershed, although in recent years we seem to be seeing a more pronounced fall flood. Rainfall during the summer tends to be infrequent, so conservation of groundwater is very important in the system in terms of maintaining stream flows and maintaining stream temperatures throughout the summer. Some of the key flow information provided by uh, Luke Warkington's work for the Nicola watershed as they relate to habitat includes uh, finding that mean August flows in the last two decades were 26% lower than they were a century ago. Uh, we're also seeing more precipitation in the form of rain versus snow, and we are seeing more conspicuous peaks in average daily flows in November in recent decades. So here is the Nicola River hydrograph at Spences Bridge for 2019, and it just gives sort of a, a look at, at what the typical uh, hydrograph looks like on the Nicola. So we have this pronounced peak in late April through May, as well as a small blip in flows in uh, late October or November. So in 2016, Doug Lewis uh, released a report where they conducted a hydrologic hazard assessment for the Merritt Timber Supply Area. And in this report, he notes almost prophetically that uh, the primary factor contributing to elevated riparian and stream flow hazard is extensive salvage of mountain pine beetle affected forests over the past decade, resulting in elevated equivalent clear cut area and harvesting adjacent to streams in higher elevation subbasins, basins, and watersheds. In light of the hydrologic hazard assessment that was conducted and released in 2016, it's interesting to look at the two major flood events we had back to back in 2017 and 2018, where we see flood flows peaking over 300 cubic meters per second. This uh, hydrogra hydrograph represents uh, discharge from uh, the Water Survey of Canada Station at Spences Bridge. So here we see it over 300 cubic meters per second in 2017, and then a similar pattern in 2018, having two runs of a century back to back. This resulted in all sorts of issues in terms of um, threats to infrastructure, uh, and all of the problems that are typically associated with flooding. So here's a photo of the uh, low gradient section of the Nicola upstream of town that is uh, highly prone to flood due to its low gradient. 
and uh, some of the issues that are seen with respect to uh, some of the houses that have been built on the floodplain there, causing all sorts of uh, issues. So flooding in 2017, 2018 did result in major channel shifts as well, particularly downstream of the city of Merritt, where the uh, stream energy increases with uh, increased channel gradients. Flood effects on Gishon Creek also resulted in emergency situations for many of the residents that live along this stream and was the focus of a lot of in-stream works, particularly in 2017. David Reed, in his report, where he basically conducted uh, forensic analysis of, of the flood effects from 2017-2018, observed average increases in channel width along Gishon Creek starting in 2016 through 2018 of 10.1 meters, 41.4 meters, and 84.6 meters, respectively. So, um, an eight-fold increase in channel widths. Sediment movement resulted, uh, also resulted in increased accumulation of sediment uh, in the stream bed in lower sections of Gishon Creek on the alluvial fan near the confluence of the Nicola and uh, also caused formations of large sediment wedges downstream of its confluence with the Nicola River. So here's a photo depicting uh, some of the flood, flood flows, uh, this was taken from 2018. And again, this is upstream of the Highway 8 crossing on uh, Gishon Creek. So you can see the riparian area fully inundated by water. In this video, uh, we show just a, an example of, of what these flood flows looked like in the channel. Here we've got uh, a video from Lower Sunshine Valley uh, between East Sunshine Valley Road and Spies Creek depicting some of the flood effects there. And so uh, there was some, some major channel shifts that occurred within this reach, perhaps due to the lack of riparian cover and uh, lack of roughness on a floodplain, and so uh, the increase in current velocities. 2018, 2017 flood effects uh, provide opportunities for habitat restoration. There's a lot of uh, work that needs to be done in order to perhaps stabilize some of these channels and to revegetate them so that they're perhaps more resistant to flood effects in the future. It's important to note also that David Reed in his 2020 report identifies uh, a risk in terms of near-term flooding that may result in further channel instability. So it's something to consider when we're uh, looking at prioritizing restoration options in these flooded reaches. The Nicola River is a temperature sensitive stream and experiences uh, maximum stream temperatures throughout the summer that are beyond some of the critical levels for survival and growth of salmonids, juvenile salmonids uh, living in the system or returning adults that are uh, moving in to spawn. Uh, Luke Workington found that uh, in, his in his research found that mean August temperatures uh, over the last century increased by about 2 degrees Celsius. The Nicola River is highly variable in terms of temperature within the various subcatchments and even within different reaches. And to exemplify this, I've just included some temperature data of my own from the summer of 2018. Both temperature stations on the Nicola River, one downstream of uh, the Nicola Lake Dam, as seen on the right, where you see uh, high street stream temperatures up to about 26 degrees in the uh, peak of summer, so around August 1st. But what you see in this section of stream is that because Nicola Lake has such a large thermal mass and we have uh, water being released from the top layer of the lake, the epilimnetic uh, layer, there's very low variability uh, in temperature within you know, a 24 hour period. And so temperature doesn't really fluctuate a lot, uh, often less than two degrees uh, between minimum and maximum within a single day. Further downstream, however, in lower reaches of the Nicola River or in the Coldwater River, although you may experience, the river may experience similarly high uh, maximums up to around 26 degrees, you see a sharp drop in temperature to the high teens overnight, which might provide sort of a, a 
temporal form of thermal refugia where fish can uh, move about and do what they need to do uh, during those, uh, those minimum temperatures. So if we look at sort of a snapshot of temperatures on the Nicola and relate those to some of the general growth and lethality values that are available to us for Chinook, Coho and Steelhead, we see that most of the Nicola River experiences maximum stream temperatures in the summertime, which are beyond lethal limits. And even the minimum temperatures that are experienced during those maximum temperature days, typically late July or early August, are also above uh, lethal limits or could potentially uh, severely limit uh, growth of these species. Uh, interestingly enough, so these are some temperature sensors that I had deployed for 2018 and uh, Clapperton Creek seemed to show uh, a, a little bit more uh, leeway in terms of temperature and having minimum temperatures at least that were sort of within optimal range for survival and growth of, of juvenile Pacific salmon. Some important work to highlight is the sensitive habitat inventory mapping and aquatic uh, habitat index work that was conducted by Ecoscape in 2016 and reported on in 2017. Uh, Ecoscape has also performed a second iteration of this work in 2020, the results of which we are waiting for. But the uh, 2017 report indicated some pretty interesting findings, uh, including six to seven percent of streams, stream banks along the Nicola main stem, had severe bank erosion, which was largely attributed to the removal of riparian vegetation. 32% of the left downstream bank and 55% of the right downstream bank exhibit, exhibited anthropogenic alteration as well. Primary impacts were attributed across the stream to uh, agricultural, urban, and highway infrastructure activities. And an important piece of this work as well was the identification of 12 high priority restoration potential sites. And they've also included some uh, interesting information related to aquatic habitat in indices across the Nicola River uh, downstream up to the, the up to the dam on Nicola Lake. Another important analysis that they provided was looking at the difference between the recorded aquatic habitat potential in each section of the stream uh, and comparing that to the potential aquatic habitat index of that site given some sort of restoration activity. And so this uh, chart could actually be really important to us in terms of prioritizing some of these key sites that have the potential for restoration where they are currently impaired but may be improved uh, in terms of fish habitat. Some of the primary habitat concerns that we've identified as part of this process include the level of equivalent clear-cut area that we have across the watershed and the effects that it, this has on the storage and timing, duration and intensity of freshet flows. The loss of riparian vegetation, specifically black cottonwood, and their effects in providing shade, bank stability and habitat complexity. Also the effects of high summer stream temperatures on the survival and growth of juvenile Chinook, Coho and Steelhead. The drought effects and suboptimal stream flow conditions experienced in August, uh, which have been correlated with low productivity in Chinook salmon by Luke Workington. Connectivity issues of streams and floodplains, not always uh, in the longitudinal direction, but more uh, related to some of the lateral effects uh, with respect to floodplain con connectivity, habitat uh, recruitment, and uh, recruitment of thermal refugia for the future, as well as uh, providing an important release of energy during high intensity floods. Some of the restoration ideas that we've talked about uh, with the Nicola Research Collaborative include, include some large scale riparian planting, as suggested by Luke Workington, and supported by the sensitive habitat inventory mapping. Uh, application of beaver dam analogs to improve storage, hyper exchange, and available rearing habitat for juvenile salmonids. Stabilization of some of the large aggradations of sediment along the main stem of the, of the Nicola River. 
also promoting hydrologic recovery and future protection of impaired watersheds through collaboration with First Nations, government, and industry. Thank you.